Good morning and welcome to uh, what is the final webinar in our series of, uh, of five, where we've taken a look at the unique aspects of running a family-owned business. Um, my name's Tony Lockwood uh, and I'm an operating partner within the professional services firm Gunner Cook. And across our sort of operating partner and legal practices of, uh, of over 300 partners now, both in the UK and Germany uh, and, and, and other um, uh, European uh, countries, uh, we have uh, extensive experience of working alongside owners of family businesses uh, at all stages of their evolution from relatively new starts to uh, second and third generation, um, small as well as large organisations. Uh, and, and this experience has led us to identify uh, five core areas where we feel family-owned businesses differ from uh, those organisations that are run not by a family uh, in a more traditional way. Uh, and, it, and it's these differences that we've explored across this, these, uh, this series of seminars and webinars. <clears throat> I'll just give you a brief overview uh, for those that haven't uh, been able to attend the previous ones. Uh, but the five areas are, number one, we, we spoke about profitability and growth. Um, and, and that's important for all businesses, absolutely. But we feel that in, in our experience, it's far more important um, for family-owned businesses because as the family grows and we get into second and third generation, the demands of the business to fund the family needs grows exponentially. Um, and, 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 and that can create a significant challenge to the business. And, and, and can create lots of issues around decision-making. So are we making this decision because it's the right thing for the business or are we making it because we need to deliver more and more revenue or more and more income, shall we say, for, for, for the family to fund the family needs? So that sort of profitability into growth to dr keep driving that business forward is, 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 is very, very relevant to a family-owned business. And uh, we covered that in seminar one. And um, I should say, actually, uh, we, re we recorded all of, the, uh, all of the sessions and we're recording this one. Um, so if you um, want to find out what we, what we uh, covered in, in each of these sessions, let me know and we can send you a link to the videos. The, the second webinar that we did um, looked at, uh, well, we called it Succession. But it was more about the people aspects of business. And again, um, talk, we spoke about the challenges of introducing um, family members into businesses, um, especially into leadership roles where there are existing non-family members in place. And, and the challenges and issues that result as, uh, uh, off, off the back of attempting to do that and how to manage that dynamic in the most effective way both for the um, the family member but just as importantly for the non-family members so that you protect yourself from any employment related legal issues shall we say and we uh, that we, we did share a number of examples where, where that had um, I'd come back to bite um, so some of the businesses that we've been working with over the, over the last few years. The third um, webinar covered strategy and vision. Uh, and again, um, every organisation needs, needs clear vision and, and, and a clear strategy on which to deliver that vision. Uh, but again, the added complexity for a family owned business is to ensure that the vision and strategy for the family is aligned to the vision and strategy for the business. And when a business starts off, it's relatively straightforward. Um, but as the business grows and we get second and third generations involved, it's quite easy to get splinter groups. And uh, this is apparent, certainly in the construction business, um, um, in, in the construction sector, there are so many of the big construction firms that when you look back, um, and, 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 and track back to the original ownership. It was one family, but now they splintered off into a number of different organizations, primarily because different family groups wanted to take the business in different directions. So um, if we're not careful, that uh, misalignment of family vision and family strategy and, 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 and the business uh, can create some challenges and, uh, um, and, and puts that added pressure on, onto family-owned businesses. The fourth one, which we did probably about three or four weeks ago, um, I suppose started to look at, <coughs> excuse me, started to look at um, 
how you can manage the conflicts that come from the from from the other areas. Um, and 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 again, what we what we try to emphasise is that. Although conflict exists in all businesses, when it's uh, when the conflict is with, between family members, that the challenge of a conflict being in the boardroom, then going home and being around the dinner table, it, it, it means that it's it's ever present. And and uh, you know we've we've all I'm sure we've all come across and had experiences of of breakdowns in families, um, and the impact that that can have on on a business. Uh, it can and often is very significant. Um, and again, as, as as the family grows, or sorry, as the family business grows, um, the it's it, you you you're not only re, um, uh, you're not only there to provide a service to to the family and provide an income to the family. You've got your employees and and, and, and your other stakeholders to take care of as well. Um, so again, just we, we, we looked at different ways to mitigate conflict and, and manage conflict, conflict in, 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 a, in, a, in a much more sort of constructive way. Uh, and the, the fifth area, the final area that we're going to cover today is about governance. Um, and um, there's, in the UK in particular, there's a significantly greater focus in recent years on company governance generally. Um, and uh, what we're going to cover today is some examples of where governance has gone wrong within businesses. So one of which that we're going to talk to in depth isn't a family owned business, to be fair, but there's lots of lessons that you can learn from that that are equally applicable to, to family owned businesses. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, all of these are intrinsically linked together uh, and and in previous um, webinars what we found was that we would stray into each of the areas and, and on each of the uh, on each of the webinars um, but I again, again I think it's just worthwhile um, to sort of put the context for, for this one um, out there by just identifying those five areas and, and at the end um, <clears throat> we've covered uh, we've created a, um, a, 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 a an ebook on uh, what we call the family business guide uh, that covers these in, in, in a little bit more detail and provides uh, um, some some ideas about what what you can do to uh, to mitigate some of the issues that we, we, we've discussed so if anybody wants a copy of that let me know and we can send you a copy over um, as I said earlier <coughs> excuse me um, this 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 is going to be recorded. We want it to be as interactive as possible. So please do um, uh, jump in and, and ask questions, make comments, share your experiences as we go along. Um, um, although it, it is recorded, what we want to do is make sure that this is a safe environment. So uh, Chatham House rules exist. So if there's anything that we discuss uh, today that you wouldn't necessarily want to be in the public domain in a video, uh, let us know, we'll edit that out before we release the video. Um, so I'll be sharing some slides um, So um, in, in a second. Um, so if, the, if you have got any comments or, or, or questions, do just, just come on and shout out because uh, when you're sharing slides, you don't actually see uh, many, of the, uh, many of the images of, of you looking, looking at me. So uh, I might miss um, you, uh, you, you, if you put your hands up or whatever. So just, uh, just interrupt me and, and ask the, uh, ask the question. Um, so before I uh, sort of start to share my screen, um, is there anything, any? Oh, damn, you've gone. Um, is there any questions that you have or any comments that you want to make before we, uh, before we formally get into the detail? No. Okay. Let me share my screen. So, um, as I said earlier, governance is, a, is an issue for all businesses, uh, and certainly in the UK, um, the way organisations, both large PLCs and, 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 and SMEs, are governed has become, uh, is an area that's uh, got a lot much more, a much more sort of government focus over the last five to ten years, um, and a big piece of work was done. Um, probably about four or five years that resulted in, in a change in um, the governance code. Um, and, and, but, what, but, but let's start by understanding what do we mean by governance? Um, uh, and, and at a very simplistic level, corporate governance 
is the system by which companies are directed and controlled. Um, you know, sim put simply, board of directors are responsible for the governance of their companies. Um, and shareholders' role in governance is to appoint the directors and the auditors and to satisfy themselves that appropriate governance structures in place. So there's this sort of two level uh, aspects of two, two, two stages, two stage aspects of, of, of corporate governance. In a family business where uh, most of the um, um, board of directors will be shareholders in many respects, or, or, or at the same time, um, there may be shareholders that are not actively involved in running the company, but are still family members, that starts to get very blurred and, and that can create issues for organisations um, and can start to <clears throat> create challenges that not only has an impact upon um, from a corporate perspective and from a legal perspective, whether or not you're meeting your legal responsibilities as, as, as a director of the company might have an impact. But it can have lots of impacts internally around the uh, and, and affect the culture of the organisation and the underlying performance of the organisation. If the uh, if it's seen within the wider business that there's this blurring of responsibilities. And and um, the corporate governance code basically says it's it's about facilitating effective entrepreneurial but prudent management that can deliver long-term sustainable success of the company. So as a book, as I, and, and apologies if I'm uh, uh, teaching you to suck eggs here, but as a director of the company, you've got the responsibility for maintaining the future of that company. It's an entity in its own right. So you've got that responsibility for maintaining that, 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 that the future of that, that business. Um, and and um, the key is to, ensure that you've got these, this structure in place that allows you to manage that, that long-term sustainable success of the future, uh, 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 sorry, the long-term sustainable success of the company by having proper processes in place and proper structures in place and that sort of separation of responsibilities. Excuse me. We're going. We're just going to go into uh, an example of when it went wrong, and, and as I said, this, this we'll go into a little bit of detail about Patisserie Valley. Um, it's not a family-owned business, um, um, but a lot of the, a lot of the lessons that came out of uh, out of um, um, the review of um, Patisserie Valley um, is very very relevant, and I'll explain a little bit more as we go along. <clears throat> But but in, but in essence, what we what we've got, um, and, and, and well, shout out if you've ne never heard of Patisserie Valerie. Um, they're they're a, um, um, a high street um, retail operation cafe that did uh, cakes and and um, um, patisseries um, 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 across most of the most of the UK. I'm not too sure whether they they, they went overseas. To be fair. Um, but they they uh, they hit the headlines um, three or four years back because there was a massive um, fallout um, and, and a big black hole that appeared in their accounts, um, and uh, subsequently they, the, the a significant part of the business closed down. But if we just look back at what went wrong, uh, May in, in in sort of early two thousand eighteen, two directors um, and and uh, and ultimately shareholders were awarded twice as many share options as expected. Um, and they took advantage of that um, by taking cash out of the business um, of, you know, it's been reported four, four and a half million pounds. Um, that was then compounded um, because in June, there was a valuation um, that was quoted that uh, as, a, as a business, it was worth you know, half a billion pound. Um, which was 23 times earnings. And anyone who's done any work in corporate finance knows that that is unsustainable, um, especially for a bricks and mortar type of business. Um, when the shares were suspended um, in, in, uh, in, in October 18, 
um, after um, um, issues were, 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 were identified. Um, the shares were suspended and the valuation at that time was 450 million. By November, um, they had to uh, put in, um, they'd started to run out of cash, so they had to put in a fundraising deal and they raised 15 million. Um, but it was done on the understanding that the business would make profits of 12 million. Um, and all of this stuff has, has started to happen with the management team, the shareholders, blurring those lines that we, do, we, that we were talking about earlier and not having that sort of clarity around sort of corporate governance. Um, so in January 19, uh, uh, um, an administrator was appointed because they, you know, they found that the, uh, they run out of cash basically. Um, and they found that there was a, a 94 million pound black hole um, in, in the accounts. Um, and Chris Marsh, who was the finance director um, <clears throat> at the time, uh, was arrested um, uh, as, uh, because of, of his involvement in, in, in covering up uh, that black hole. <clears throat> and they found that there was a significant number of false entries in the company's like ledgers. Um, and and uh, again, the directors had started to, it became apparent very quick, quickly, the directors started to work to, to hide things from, from, the, uh, uh, from, from, from the shareholders, uh, but also from, from, from the wider uh, business community. Uh, cash had been overstated by 50 million, uh, 54 million pounds, um, and that the, the debts had been understated significantly as well. Um, so there was a significant discrepancy found. Um, and you know, I suppose the final aspect of that process was that the uh, auditors that were Grant Thornton um, um, didn't, didn't come out of this too well, shall we say. Um, they'd, they'd actually missed two secret bank accounts, um, which, um, as you can imagine, um, created some challenges for them as well. But if we start to look at um, what that what 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 the shareholders started to say when this came out, um, Luke Johnson being the the major shareholder, um, um, he, he's he's quoted to be saying that you know they received solid weekly numbers, man, comprehensive management accounts, clean bill of house by uh, uh, by auditors. He was he was quite relaxed, um, but at the same time. He was. He, he started to acknowledge that um, uh, he needed to take a, a much closer look at things and get more actively involved with things. It, it, it left that. It left the management team on their own effectively, and not not challenge them enough um, within the boardroom or or, or, or elsewhere. Um, and that had a massive personal impact on him. He started to feel ill. He got very depressed, uh, and. Uh, having been a very successful business uh, owner and got involved in multiple similar businesses, uh, very successful over the year, he, he did start to wonder whether his career was over um, and, and whether or not he should go elsewhere. Um, and again, the I suppose the summary of it, and the, 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 this, is the, this is the slide that I think is very relevant from a family owned business, because it's very easy for this sort of stuff to get involved in, in a family owned business. The board had become way too cosy. They'd, you know, they'd worked together for twelve years, and in, in some respects, a board that has uh, uh, that had worked together for so long should be a positive. But it's only a positive if they are open to challenge. If they become too close and, and, and not open to challenge, and don't have any external um, uh, factor or, or external challenge, um, then the likelihood is they'll start to miss stuff. And this is where we find that a lot of the time we have family owned businesses, you know, the, 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 the family has grown together, you know, naturally, they know each other. There's that sort of uh, hierarchy where, um, um, where, where it might be grandmother or grandfather that set the business up. And then the sons and daughters have got involved and grandsons and daughters have got involved. Um, but they'll never challenge the original founder or they'll find it difficult to challenge that, that, that grandmother or grandfather. Um, and that, that coziness can, can create a significant challenge in the family-owned business. There's a, you know, there's a, um, in this case, there's a laziness and arrogance. You know, they were replicating what they'd done in, in different models and they just thought it was an easy process. And again, within a family-owned business, that, 
wouldn't say necessarily laziness, but that arrogance is often seen. It's like, well, we've always done it like this, so why do we need to change? You know, why do we need to? It's always worked, but the world's moved on, other stuff's happened, and it's understanding what needs to, what, what, what needs to put in place. And again, having that external challenges is, is, uh, is, is, is very relevant. Um, and, and, and again, coming back to that sort of culture that we spoke about earlier, that, that um, need for effective entrepreneurial and prudent management. Um, this, the focus we're doing for TCV Valerie is, is wholly entrepreneurial. Um, they didn't have that prudent aspect in, in, into the business. And again, what we find um, with family businesses is going back to some of the things that we've covered in, in, in previous webinars, is that, that drive for growth, that drive for increasing profitability tends to drive that entrepreneurial spirit. You know, the, the, the family have taken significant risk and they'll go and carry on taking those risks because they need to drive it forward. And sometimes that can um, um, very quickly become unhinged and, 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 and create significant challenge. Um, and it's not, um, it's not unusual for family-owned businesses to hit a cliff edge, especially when they're going into third generation. And often though, at that stage, they either splinter off or um, they get sold to, 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 to external, external sources because of that splintering um, in terms of that. Some people, uh, some part of the family want to drive it forward while others want to take a little bit more of a prudent measure. And, and that can start to become a, a challenge within family owned businesses. Um, and, and the final aspect of participatory value there is, is, is the auditors just didn't do the job with sufficient care. But the key message there is that external influence just wasn't there. Um, so going back to looking at the governance code, um, you know, I, I won't go through this in any details, but you know, there's significant pieces of work that's been done sort of over the last few years to really start to sharpen um, what's required. Uh, and this is now written into law. We, we you know, the, the, um, uh, any organization that employs, I think it's over 50, 50 people need to have independent directors on board. A lot of organizations of that size don't have those in, in place. A lot of family businesses don't have them in place, but actually it, it, it's, um, it, it is now, becoming um, uh, much more important that you uh, that, that you take this on board um, because it applies to all accounting periods um, beginning on or after the 1st of January 2019. And it looks what, what it looks looks like for any organization but again within family owned businesses it, it's about having clarity around the board leadership and company purpose. We spoke about that in Company purpose certainly we spoke about that in, in previous in previous webinars, but that board leadership um, is is critical in, in having that effective board in place that is independent to the family. Uh, and again, we spoke about that way to to maintain that independence between what's right for the family, and what's right for the business in a previous webinar. But there is that division of responsibility. It needs to be written down and be clear. Um, within the within the governance structure of the business, it needs to determine from a um, a shareholders' perspective which members of the family are shareholders, and which members of the family are board of directors, and be clear about the difference of, of the responsibilities between the two, um, and put in place a formal process where challenging review can can happen between the two. Um, it needs to be clear about the composition of that board, um, and, and and I said, you know, they, they, we, 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 we've written into the code now is the need for an independent uh, board members on boards of 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 a, of a certain size. It needs to be clear about the succession process, and it needs to be clear about the evaluation process, the evaluation around um, remuneration, evaluation around uh, performance. Uh, business performance, individual performance. There needs to be absolute clarity around audit, risk and internal controls. And that needs to be very structured and, 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 and be able to be evidenced. And the remuneration needs to be clearly um, uh, uh, clearly structured in terms of the, 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 the way that remuneration is calculated and, 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 and agreed. 
Um, and again, this becomes this can become more of an issue within family-owned businesses because the pressure that's applied by those board members to the shareholders to sign things off, especially if there's a family relationship, um, um, can create challenges and often do just just create challenges. And you know, as as we found in um, Patisserie Valerie, you know, that pressure was applied. So that they got the the the, uh, the share options at a much higher rate than they they they, they should have done, which then started to uh, unravel. Um, so under, I suppose, in very layman terms, it's it's about ensuring that as a board, as a shareholders, as a family, you engage in all stakeholders to um, help. And drive the success of the future of, 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 of the business. And those stakeholders are your um, your employees, your professional advisors, your suppliers, your customers. It's 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 in, it's looking at the whole thing because without any without uh, without one aspect of, of, of those stakeholders, the likelihood of the business will suffer or, or potentially ultimately fail. So it's understanding what the key stakeholders, who the key stakeholders are, and engaging with them on an ongoing basis, and doing it from a position of we need to do what's right for the business, and separate that um, that aspect of what's right for the business against what's right for the family. Sort that out absolutely, but from the business perspective, view it that what's right for the long-term sustainable future of the business. And, and, and it's about really driving that company purpose and 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 driving the um, culture of the organization and the diversity within the board within the boardroom and and that diversity comes across all different you know, but the diversity in its widest context uh, but within within a family business in particular the diversity aspect is very much about non-family members getting non-family members around that board table um, as well as the you know the, the general the diversity aspects that all businesses need to uh, need, need to be uh, taking into account these days in terms of their board composition, and and, and again coming back to that remuneration, it, it's it's about being clear and being having an independence um, review of the remuneration process and having a remuneration committee is, is definitely the best practice. And again, that remuneration committee should be led by an independent person, um, not a family owned business, not a family member, um, because again, that, that undue influence can, 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 can very easily be applied. <clears throat> so, um, one of the key things that have come out of the various reviews that have happened um, is this this aspect of independence uh, and and having an independent voice on the board, and in the various reports um, uh, that's that's been used to sort of formulate the the, the, the corporate code, then there's there's been a stress that we need to have independent non-exec directors, and those need to be of sufficient caliber. Uh, a number to, to carry a significant weight in those deliberations. Um, and again, as we've said many times already, um, they need to be independent to the family um, and, 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 and having that external view. Listed boards, uh, listed companies, the, 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 the recommendation is that at least half the board are, uh, are independent and in private businesses, a minimum of two non-execs. Um, I think, um, that they, they did, as I say, I think um, for all organisations with 50 employees or more, they're recommending at least one non-exec. And, and, and that, those non-execs should be, have that independent oversight. They should be impartial. They should have the ability to bring in a, an external perspective. Uh, and with that external perspective, be able to um, have constructive challenge and deliver constructive challenge to the both the um, uh, board of uh, board of directors and were necessary to the shareholders. And again, um, that's the added value that a non-exec can provide to family-owned businesses. You have that ability to break the link, I suppose, between 
what's right for the family and what's right for the business. A non-exec will always defer to what's right for the business, but will start to, um, um, uh, will be able to provide a sounding board um, for the family uh, and the shareholders to ensure that you know that the, the, these issues are put out, in, um, um, put out there in the first place, but resolved uh, as, as quickly as possible. Um, and they, and they should and ultimately they should have that sort of wide experience, um, and so that they can bring that, um, so that they can add value, I suppose, to the board and to the business um, from the experience that they've gained in, in, in other businesses. So how does this fit in with what we do within um, within Gunnacup? Um, well, fundamentally, um, we we provide um, um, a service called uh, non exec Plus, or so NED Plus, um, and and the NEDs that we provide um, and the non exec directors that we provide, as well as the wider access to the wider Gunnacup team, can help. Um, to, to meet these sort of key responsibilities really to, 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 to help provide the external factor so you can really get um, a, a better understanding of strategic direction of the business, to help provide that independence of, of review around performance monitoring so that we can um, really be clear about whether or not the business is performing in the way that the reports are saying they are that independent ability to, de uh, to, uh, to dig deeper, to uh, determine the remuneration, as we've said already, uh, but also to start to build that sort of external communication and, and, and introduce networks to, uh, to relevant people and start to take um, within, within family owned businesses uh, an internally focused organisation to become a much more externally focused organisation. Significant element around risk and audit, really about getting that integrity in, in, in the, from both the financial information, but also about the, the, the processes around financial controls and, and risk management. Um, and the NED Plus, um, um, oops, sorry, I've gone the other way. So on the NED Plus, um, what, we, what, we, what we do there is, is, is provide family-owned businesses with a traditional non-exec director and within the operating partner practice we've got people that have run blue chip organizations we've got people that have um, uh, run um, and sold fast growth businesses so we've got a whole range of experienced people that we can put and drop into a traditional non-exec role to assist and advise the executive team on that strategy development that financial operational oversight in that that risk management aspect but the plus part is very much about giving that family-owned business access to the wider uh, network of people within Gunner Cook. So I said at the start with this with fast approaching 300 partners, um, lawyers, consultants, and, and the operating partners that have got this very wide uh, um, uh, range of experience and skills that we can mobilize very quickly. So for um, an organization um, where they, they've come across an issue or a challenge or indeed an opportunity, then we can mobilize a team very, very quickly from that wide uh, network of people that can um, quickly and very uh, effectively provide advice to the management team to overcome those issues, challenges or opportunities. Uh, and it's all done for a fixed monthly fee. Um, so people know where they stand, they know what it's, what's, what, what, what it's going to take, and they know they've got access to these, these, these specialists um, really um, um, very, very quickly. So that's, that's what we're, we're um, that, I suppose that's the end of, 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 the, um, of, of the presentation. Just let me stop sharing and coming back into the main screen. So any questions, comments, experiences that you want to share? No, thank, that's, that's great. Thanks, Tony. Um, one thing um, that I'm often asked about is the remuneration, trying to get like benchmarking. I often get that query as an employment lawyer. Yeah. As a NED, are there any... Oh. <laughs> 
I didn't do anything to cut that question off there. You know, <laughs> um, if uh, when you're asked about remuneration, what sort of um, what what sort of information do you get? Is there a sort of a benchmarking service or anything like that that you can use? Yeah, I think um, yeah, absolutely. It, it, there's there's lots of benchmarking. Um, 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 data research available in the public domain and I think that's again where and it's available to boards generally if they go and look at it but what, you know, what, what we find is that we know where to go we've got experience of other organizations and it's it, a lot of the time uh, uh, that the NEDS uh, the, the non-exec director approach will be to take their experience from other organizations mm -hmm. and start to apply it uh, so it's not just looking at the the research and the data it's actually being able to um, uh, to um, embrace that data, but apply it and, and demonstrate how other organisations have applied it, yeah. similar sort of organisations that have applied it and, and the impact that it's had on the board and, 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 the, and the, the relevant directors. Um, any more questions, comments? I've got a comment if I may, Tony. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I am a Ned and I do work with family companies. I've generally found in my own limited experience with family companies, I've, I've generally found that the, the governance is quite shocking. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's very often non-existent. Very often they don't have formal board meetings for the simple reason they don't need to. You know, they get together on a Sunday and they have a meal and they talk about things and then they argue about it sometimes during the week. Uh, and, and some of them will travel into work together and yeah. you know, all these discussions are going on and nothing is formalized, nothing is, nothing is proper. And um, it, it, it's a little bit worrying that um, so many apparently successful businesses um, have operated this way for so long. It, is that your experience as well? Yes, yeah, it is. Especially for those um, those organisations that are go that have gone through growth very very quickly, um, we, we find that you know if you start off, you know, it might be two or three brothers or you know you know some siblings, shall we say, um, that have basically come together and and started a um, a business off, or, or a father and son or a mother and daughter. Um, and um, it's grown very, very quickly. And suddenly they, they are there employing 50, 100, 150 people, but they still run it like, as you say, like it was on day one, um, where it was just on the back of the fag packet and um, uh, around, around, the, uh, around the dinner table. Um, uh, and because they've not, in many instances in, the, in, in those scenarios, didn't have any, don't have any ex external experience, of running businesses, or being senior, uh, a senior leadership team of other businesses, they've got nothing to compare it with. So, so, and, and that, and that's the challenge. They, they don't, they don't know what they don't know, um, and and I think that's where the one of the big advantages of the Ned role is. It, it, it's to it's to provide them with that external insight into what good looks like. Um, and and what bad looks like, um, but but equally what the minimum expectation is, um, and, and and I think historically that's been okay. But I think what's happening um, um, recently uh, with with the change in the governance code is is that it, it it it's becoming much more enforceable. Government is getting more involved because um, you know as, if these are, if these organisations fail and they've got two three four hundred people employed. The impact is goes far beyond just the family, um, and, um, and and things like participatory Valerie and, and organisations like that, and, yeah, and, and, and the, the the other big one recently was Carillion, um, which again not family business, but the lessons that you can learn from those big failures apply to smaller organisations themselves. Um, so that sort of drive to put the the governance code in place. Um, is there and will become much more relevant over the next few years. Um, so I, I, I my, my guess, COVID's got in the way. Um, I think if COVID hadn't happened, this we, we'd be a lot further forward. There'd be a lot more uh, focused activity in, in getting these these systems and structures in place and forcing it for, for those sort of mid-sized organisations. But, but I think once we come out of it, that, that, that drive will happen again. 
some of the work I'm doing with some of my family owned 